Hello, and welcome to our third and final webinar in our Future of Thinking series on critical thinking. I'm Kristen Taylor from Kepner Trigo. Before we dive into the presentation, just a few housekeeping items. We'd love to have you engage with us and are happy to take questions throughout the webinar. To ask a question, simply submit the question using the Ask a Question button located on the top left-hand side of the player. We will address your inquiries during the Q&A period of the presentation. Next, we want to know if you find this use of time valuable. So at the end of the session, please take a moment to rate by clicking on the Rate This button on the right-hand side of the player. Finally, a recorded version of this presentation will be available immediately following the conclusion of the event. Please feel free to share this using the social buttons above your console. We will also send you a version through email that might be easier to share with your colleagues. Today, our session will be led by Jason O'Neill of Kepner Trigo and Veena Rajkumar of Western Digital. Thank you for spending this time with us, and now I'll turn it over to Jason to kick us off. Thanks, Kristen. Um, hello, everyone. Again, I'm Jason O'Neill. I'm the head of global training services for Kepner Trigo. My job is um, I own the product portfolio for KT for our problem solving, decision making, and critical thinking uh, classes and training. And I'm so fortunate to be joined by my friend and colleague, Veena Rajkumar, uh, the global learning and development manager for Western Digital. Veena and I have done a couple of webinars together now, and she's dialed in from India where she lives. Want to say hello, Veena? Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, thrilled to present with you today, Veena. So I'm going to just jump right into our, to our content. So why do we care about critical thinking? Um, so let's start off with, with an easy one. There is a lot of evidence of critical thinking's continued importance today. Uh, according to a recent Wall Street Journal article, um, there was an analysis done by Indeed.com that found that mentions for critical thinking in job postings have doubled since 2009. 50% yeah, more, that's pretty amazing. Um, or it's 100% more, that's pretty amazing. And um, there's research from another group called Payscale that found that managers who are hiring college graduates um, have really said overwhelmingly, up to 60% of them, that these college grads do not have the critical thinking and problem-solving skills that they need to be successful in today's workforce. Uh, additionally, 56% of those managers say that um, these new hires and graduates don't pay attention to detail. That's a problem, right? Um, another report that uh, Veen and I have mentioned in the past is that um, the World Economic Forum released a study in 2016 of um, HR and organizational development managers across the world who said that critical thinking will be uh, the number one or top priority skill for companies that are hiring in the year 2020 and beyond. So you have hiring managers wanting people with critical thinking skills, HR managers saying that's going to be critical for the future of work, and uh, I think it's pretty compelling that critical thinking still remains um, an absolutely imperative skill. You also might take a look at this picture and say, does this resemble what you do at work? Um, our lives are, are kind of crazy right now. I think so many people feel our work days are just insane. Um, we feel overwhelmed, and um, there's just this constant barrage of things going on in our lives. But the amazing thing is Americans are actually spending less time at work than they ever have before. Um, but that's not the perception that we share. And why is that? That's probably a combination of a lot of things, but it's the type of work we're doing now the incredible amounts of data that we're just constantly slammed and overwhelmed with. Um, email and digital is all taking up a ton of time. And we're just never disconnected from our phones and devices and computers and email and everything else. And there's this sense that we need to do it all. Okay? And wouldn't it be nice if there was a way for us to slow down and be able to handle this stuff a little bit better? Um, so when we talk about critical thinking, you also have to look at what makes us uniquely human. And um, what comes along with that is the way that our brain 
has been acting as human beings for tens of thousands of years. Um, we create something called thinking heuristics or rules of thumb or mental shortcuts. Um, there is so much info out there, our brains can't possibly process all of it, and it needs to take a shortcut. These shortcuts are absolutely critical to what we are in the human race. Think about making a decision for what you want to eat for lunch. If you wanted to make the perfect decision, it might take 15 minutes to dissect the menu, think about what the most healthy thing are, what did you have for food yesterday, what are you having tomorrow, and then you never have lunch. Um, well, then also think about 25,000 years ago when humans were trying to escape from wild animals out um, in the wild, and do you really want to take 15 or 20 minutes to think about your best escape route before just running like heck? I, I don't think so, right? Um, you want to think about what's going to taste best now for me and make the decision in a couple of seconds, or what's the way I'm going to get out of this jam and not get eaten? Um, it's pretty important that we can react in seconds so we're not turned into lunch. And so these thinking heuristics are critical to the way we are as humans. There's a, um, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist named Daniel Kahneman. Um, he had a great quote around, um, or just a great um, analogy around these thinking heuristics, where he said that um, our brains are basically taking really hard questions and substituting them for easier questions. And think about the shortcut like this. You have to make a, a tough choice. Let's say you have to vote for president of the United States or an elected official where you are. And uh, the hard question is, who should you support most? The easier question is, who do I like to look at more? Or who would I rather have a beer with? Um, and honestly, our, brain, our brains do that. Studies show that that's how we make a lot of decisions. And think about those substitutions in hiring people, making decisions about vendors, or making big important decisions, and your brain is taking shortcuts, and you don't know quite how to handle it. Um, we, we need to look, figure out a way to think more critically, um, honestly, more than ever before. And critical thinking has been around for a long time. So let me try and define it for you. And, to, you know, I have my own definition before thinking about doing this webinar, um, but I wanted to do some research on just definitions. And I basically pulled no fewer than 20 different definitions from people all over the world who were critical thinking experts. Um, and I combined some of my own thoughts there, and I came up with this word cloud um, with hundreds of words about critical thinking. And some of the words that stood out to me were intellectual, problems, reasoning, logic or logical, evidence, conclusion, and values. These are all really good words that you know, resonated with me in terms of how I think about the definition of, of critical thinking. Um, but it, I, I didn't feel good about that you know, definition right away. Um, so I, I, was, I kind of relied back on a quote from a famous US Supreme Court justice named Potter Stewart. Potter Stewart has this great quote, I know it when I see it. Now he was referring to a slightly more adult topic with that quote. Um, but I thought it was perfect for critical thinking because defining it's really hard. You know good critical thinking when you see it, but can you define it? Um, there's a director of recruiting for the accounting firm e &Y. His quote was, critical thinking is just one of those words, like diversity, like big data, where everybody talks about it, but they mean 50 different things, and there's really no great way to define it. Um, but Veena and I thought, you know, we've got to try and give a good definition for this webinar. Um, so where I started was I went back and looked a little bit at the history of critical thinking to try and get a better idea. Um, and some of the folks on this screen you'll see here shouldn't surprise you. If you start on the top left, um, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle from 2,500 years ago um, created this ancient Greek tradition of um, really understanding the deeper realities of how people think, to think systematically, um, to be more well-reasoned. Um, and what those three led into were a series of other um, great thinkers in our time, like Francis Bacon, who laid the foundation of modern science, or Thomas More, who studied social order and utopia, uh, Machiavelli, one of our first political scientists, modern political thought, Locke was around human rights, Sir Isaac Newton, the, uh, you know, the, the natural world, 
and Adam Smith, The Invisible Hand in Economic Theory. And um, I, you know, I have to mention some of the great uh, women, um, female thinkers out there, because um, just looking them up, some of the things they accomplished were incredible. Um, Hypatia of Alexandria, you may maybe never heard of her before, but she was a philosopher that many think was comparable to Socrates, um, but who didn't survive a tragic death and all of her material was lost. Or there's Hannah Arnett, she wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism, totalitarianism. or Simone de Beauvoir, the founding mother of feminism and a philosopher on human freedom. That's also not to mention George Eliot, also known as Marianne Evans, Margaret Cavendish, and many others. And man, they j it just covers so many different topics in our lives. Critical thinking, again, it's just really hard to figure out what are we talking about. So here's our best chance. Here we go. So um, one quote from a gentleman named Tom Chatfield. He's a philosopher. And he said, critical thinking is about being more reasonable about the world. It involves coming up with arguments that support conclusions, explaining the way things are in a reasoned discourse, and you have to be willing to change your mind. Man, I love that. There's like four good, really key terms in there. Um, and logic is part of this. Being able to deduce conclusions, um, you know, what must be true if all these other things are true? Um, and making an idea, like an, a leap from you know something is right, so what other things must be right? And so I love that Tom Chatfield quote. I'll, we're going to send out, I think, an interview from uh, the philosopher um, after this call, which I think you'll, you'll enjoy. It's about 30 minutes that I really thought was a great understanding. And Vina, I know you wanted to jump in probably a slide ago with a good example, too, about where you saw critical thinking take place in your life. <laughs> Yeah, the, it sparks a memory back to when I was in school, Jason. I have this vivid memory of my teacher putting a map of the world on the board, and we didn't even think twice about it. The next day, the map disappeared, and he placed blank maps on our desks. And you know, and he said, "You have a quiz. You need to fill it in." We're not prepared for a quiz, we told him, and he said, "So what was it on the board for? Decoration?" <laughs> <laughs> So a better learning strategy should have been, why is the map on the board, right? <laughs> yeah. How would you do on the quiz? Um, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Not too well, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we, I did have a quick question from the audience. Someone asked, why do we have no pure ethicists on our list of philosophers? Honestly, I had to pick and choose the ones that I wanted to talk about. Um, in my word cloud, I showed you values, and I think ethics was also on that list as well. So not to discount that in any way, but great question from the audience. If you want to ask questions, just um, throw them into the, uh, the chat feature. That'd be great. All right, so um, here we go. So in terms of the components of critical thinking, you know, I'm going to try and make this practical as possible. We could get really deep and philosophical, but let's... Let's get practical on how we can use this in our roles. And there are six kind of key parts of critical thinking that Dean and I would like to talk about, um, many of which have multiple sub-bullets that would have taken up a slide of 8.5 if we were going to list everything. But here's the big general category. So the first is to gather. Gathering is about asking questions, making observations, to understand opinions of others, the data that exists, and to try and do it in a very open-minded way. This is where asking great questions comes into play. We're going to talk about asking questions soon, but that skill is going to help tremendously in the beginning of a critical thinking process. Next is to clarify, because it's one thing to gather, but it's another to truly understand. What are you seeing, hearing, smelling? What's going on to really understand the, the, the different parts of the problem that you're trying to solve or the topic you want to discuss. Um, and then you have to organize that information. So once you understand it, let's group it, put it in order, make connections between things. So this is where you really uncover core problems and make insights that you need to go and try and solve. Then comes the big bucket. Analysis is the big bucket. When you analyze, you're doing everything from solving problems, making decisions, planning for risk, figuring out what could go wrong, 
Um, and you begin to get closer to start drawing conclusions, but you're trying to stay in a phase where you're really understanding things in the deepest sense and starting to make much more sense of the problem that you're working on. Analysis is probably where a lot of people think of critical thinking. They think, oh, critical thinking is like problem solving. I think, well, problem solving is a part of critical thinking, just like um, analysis is. Then you get into conclusions, which is when you're using logical reasoning, drawing inferences, and um, really kind of coming up with the solutions that you want to discuss or implement or whatever else. And lastly is communicate. I, I saw a lot of definitions not include communication. I just think it's so important because if well-reasoned conversation um, is part of critical thinking, you got to be able to communicate all those things that you've uncovered in a way that um, will make sense to people. And while you most certainly could add another dozen, dozen different components here, I felt like this did a pretty darn good job um, summarizing where we thought critical thinking has kind of led us. But I wanted to ask you a question. So of those six, and I'm going to start a, uh, a poll question here. The poll question is, oh, hang on, i got to start it. Here's my button. So which of the components of critical thinking do you feel you are missing in your critical thinking process? So if you look at um, gather, clarify and organize, we had to group those together, analyze, conclude, or communicate, which one do you feel is the one that you'd like to improve the most on? Vina, for me, I, I mean, I just think the gathering part of critical thinking is so important because if you don't have the information to start and understand things in the start, it's not going to go well at the end. Um, I don't know. What are your, what's your thought on where you would like to continue improving? I think the whole process, um, Jason, you know, too often we tend to take shortcuts, like you talked about earlier, right? We, we uh, miss out, we, we jump to conclusions or we tend to take shortcuts. And I think just slowing down and going step by step, that makes a huge difference. Right. So interestingly, um, looking at the, the poll results coming in, um, communicate right now is leading. Um, ooh, actually, clarify and organize this jumped ahead very quickly. but. I would say it's sh we're sh looking at clarify and organize and communicate as two areas where people are really thinking they need to help um, help in terms of their critical thinking. I, I find that interesting, right? With clarify and organize, once you've gathered data, you're really trying to understand a problem deeply. That's where so many biases come in. That's where I think a lot of people probably struggle who haven't done a lot of critical thinking, and that makes sense. And the other one, communicate doesn't surprise me at all. To be able to have a well-reasoned conversation with someone, uh, we're going to talk about a few tips at the end to help you do that better. Um, but that is a really difficult um, skill in today's environment where nobody wants to have their minds changed about anything. Everyone's entrenched in their own views. Um, and I think that that's um, a pretty good sampling from the audience. The other one that did stand out was Gather. That's where I was with with gather. So I'm going to stop the voting here, and I appreciate everybody for, um, for weighing in on uh, which area you'd like to feel you want to improve. Um, Vina, so I think I'm going to turn it over to you here, and we have a couple of good questions from the audience, but I'll jump in in a, in a couple of minutes with those. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and you're going to talk about some more modern critical thinking um, frameworks, and then also give us some examples of where you've seen great critical thinking. Sounds great, Jason. So reasoning from first principles thinking is an excellent example of critical thinking. Aristotle defined a first principle as the first basis from which a thing is known. And so the whole premise of first principles thinking is to deconstruct and then reconstruct you break down a whole into its constituent parts and then build from that. Just like when you gather data, you start from the source. And I find that it's an effective strategy to break down, comp especially when you're dealing with complicated problems and need to generate original solutions. So you need to think like a scientist, and that's what first principles thinking is all about. Scientists don't assume anything. 
they start with questions like, what are we absolutely sure is true? What has been proven? So first principle of thinking helps you question your assumptions, and that is so important. And it helps you focus on data and observation, just like what you talked about, Jason. So famous proponents of first principle thinking are Aristotle, James Boyd, the famous fighter pilot and military strategist, and Elon Musk. Elon Musk applied the first principle thinking to create the aerospace company SpaceX. So his first principle thinking question was, what is a rocket made of? And he discovered that the materials cost of the rocket was less expensive than the actual cost of a rocket. So he decided to create his own company, purchase the raw materials for less cost, and build a rocket himself. And that's how SpaceX was born. And so now I have an exercise for the audience. So I'd like you to imagine that you have three objects, a motorboat, a bicycle, a couple of pens. Now I'd like you to break these items down into their constituent parts. So for the motorboat, say, shall we say a motor, the hull of a boat, and for the bicycle, the handlebar, wheels, and the seat, and for the pens, ink. So what I'd like you to do is deconstruct, reconstruct. What would you create? And so while our audience is working on that exercise, Jason, what would you create from these parts? <laughs> oh, I love this question, Vina. So if you want to uh, chime in, audience, on the chat feature with um, what would you deconstruct? Um, Kristen, who gave a, a great introduction, um, thought of a great example for this. So she said, I'm going to take the motor of the boat, I'm going to take the tire of the bike, and I'm going to take the ink from the pens, and I'm going to create a, a tool or a machine that's going to help me paint lines in the middle of a road so you have uh, straight lines to uh, mark roadways. I thought that was awesome, critical thinking. Because that's I, awesome. <laughs> I was thinking about it for a while and, and didn't get as quite as good as uh, it was what Kristen came up with. Um, so all you Elon Musks out there, not your, with your Twitter habits, but with your um, uh, critical thinking, what would you break down these components into and uh, let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll read some of the better ones as we, uh, as we keep going here. All right, Vina, you want to, so good work on first thinking principle. You want to jump to the next section here, which is the culture of critical thinking. Yeah, and, and, you know, Jason, the culture, when we talk about the actual elements, key elements, core elements of critical thinking, it's also the pillars and the culture that support it are, that are so important. And I'd like to particularly focus on da David Marquette, a former nuclear submarine captain and author of Turn the Ship Around. He revolutionized the concept of leadership. And I like his quote where he says, People don't want easy, they want agency. Train for critical thinking, not compliance. I really love that. You know, in a nuclear reactor plant, plant you need to follow strict guidelines and follow the process. Whereas in a submarine, the thinking needs to be more tactical, since you need to counter and neutralize the enemy effectively. And David Marquette said that the leader's role is really to create more leaders, not followers. You know, le usually leadership principles revolve around the leader-follower approach. So he advocated the importance of empowering people to think for themselves. To, and, and he particularly, you know, Jason, you talked about clarity and language. And he, he talked about using clear, specific, and assertive language. When you empower people to think for themselves, their language becomes clear, result-oriented, and proactive. And I find that true, you know, when I use words like, I will, I can do this, I recommend, it empowers me personally. So words help you create a powerful visual image. You know, think about the difference between an abstract painting and a concrete structure. Words have the power to build greater collaboration and commitment. So technical competence through training is, is another key element, and that helps it also empowers your decision-making ability because when you are highly skilled and knowledgeable, you feel confident to
to take the initiative, become more engaged, and you know, you you are willing to think of other options and other new solutions. Goals are also important because when you focus on goals instead of the process, it helps build competence as well. When people know why they have when they and they have a clear goal in mind, they are motivated to become active participants rather than passive proponents of a process. So how do we create the environment for critical thinking? I find that listening enhances understanding and communication. Trust really helps people feel safe to take the initiative. Collaborative language like we creates the feeling of community. And when you move people up the leadership ladder, you empower them. Agree to disagree. This exposes disparate opinions and encourages everyone to look at different perspectives before looking at a decision. And when, you know, when I worked, when I did some consultancy work at Wipro Technologies earlier in my career, I, I used to attend meetings where, you know, they had one group presenting for a particular idea and the other group opposing it. And that really brought all the ideas on the table and, and you know, help everyone look at different perspectives. The conventional way of thinking revolves around a consensus. And, you know, a consensus does not help you look at different perspectives. So how does all of this help build a culture for critical thinking? When people have the pillars to support their logical reasoning, decision making, then they feel confident to demonstrate greater cognitive flexibility. And, um, you know, the next, w if we go to the next slide, Jason, here's where I talk about uh, the connection between disruptive thinking, critical thinking, and innovative thinking. Disruptive thinking is a willingness to shift your paradigm. And like my mom always says, think of the bitter flavor as tasty. Change the status quo and make the impossible possible. And this is what I had talked about in my webinar on disruptive thinking earlier this year. Innovation is how you make alterations to an existing idea based on your previous experience. And Jade Pearson, regional training manager for Kepner Trego, had talked about this in, in her webinar on innovation in June. Critical thinking helps us recognize patterns, create logical connections through idea generation, and innovation. So how do our minds respond to change? How do we create new solutions? How do we become flexible in the way we approach a problem? So Jason, how do you, how do you react to crisis situations? Yeah, hopefully um, very calmly, Vina. Um, one of the things that I've always found with crisis is that the, 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 the natural way to react is to do something. And in a real crisis, the way that you're going to really get out of it is to stop, slow down, and start in the beginning with gathering information, understanding it, and go from there. If you jump right into analysis and conclusions, you're never going to get through the challenge or crisis that you're in. Excellent, Jason. That's absolutely right. You know, and Apollo 13 is an excellent example of a, of a crisis situation, how you can apply critical thinking, disruptive thinking, and innovation to create a successful outcome. So really, in a crisis situation, Jason, the ability to adapt is essential. And, you know, Apollo 13, a little more than two days into the mission, the oxygen tank exploded. As a result, there was almost no power and no heat not exactly the best way to fly. Carbon dioxide was building fast. The Apollo crew had come up with an innovative, they had to come up with an innovation, innovative solution fast to improve the environment. They had to create a carbon dioxide filter which would allow a square peg into the round filtration hole. Wow, that is quite a dilemma. Yep, the absolutely. NASA. <laughs> and so the NASA engineers disrupted the status quo by building an improvised adapter, would you believe, by using all sorts of random parts like 
a flight manual cover, suit parts, socks, to actually create an air filter. They applied their critical thinking to reassess and effectively solve the real problem. So really, the, the, the initial objective of, of Apollo 13 was to land on the moon. But after the ox oxygen tank explosion, they didn't worry about anything other than saving the crew. So critical thinking helps you define the problem, determine the real goals and objectives, create an array of different types of solutions, evaluate possible consequences of each solution, and prioritize. And as the Apollo, yeah. I just wanted to Jason. mention a few people that have chimed in with uh, audio or connection issues. There is a uh, help feature on here. Unfortunately, we can't troubleshoot over the, uh, over the airwaves here, but hopefully uh, you can get some help from Bright Talk. Um, is the best way to troubleshoot any sound or visual issues. Sorry about that, Vienna. Go ahead. Oh, no worries at all, Jason. Um, yeah. So, you know, I really like the Apollo flight controller, uh, Jerry Bostwick's quote, where he says, when bad things happen, we just calmly laid out all the options, and failure was not one of them. And so that thought process, that determination, the motivation, um, that, that also helps you become a more effective critical thinker. Just that failure is not an option. Hey, and Venus, someone yeah. chimed in with an awesome example for what to do with the three components of our boat, our pen, and our, our bike. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to give them credit. They said they would make a sled with wheels to be used in traversing snow, turning the hull of the boat to a box to side on uh, a box to side on the snow, putting the motor and turn the whole of the boat into little paddles on the wheel and connect it to the sled box and also add the handlebars to help steer it. So this seems like a combination of a toboggan sled. Uh, I don't know, but it's awesome. I love that example. <laughs> wow, that's creative. <laughs> Excellent example. example. Yeah. You're ready so for this? We have a question yep. coming up, Vina. Are we good for, ready for that? Yep, we're ready for the next question, Jason. All right. So um, Vina is going to give you – she just gave a great example of the Apollo 13 example. We have another one coming up as well. But list a couple of examples that you can think of, just amazing critical thinkers that you've seen or heard examples of, and we'll share a couple of them. So answer them in the, enter them into the question box now. What are some other just awesome examples of critical thinking? Uh, let's see if you can beat Vina's next one because it's really good. And we'll, uh, Vina, after you're done with your <laughs> example, we'll come back. Um, you're going to talk about Thai Cave, right? Yes, Jason. I was enthralled. I mean, I remember watching the news avidly every single day. I was just so enthralled every moment. The Thai Cave Rescue demonstrates how critical thinking thrives in an environment that supports embracing different perspectives and different culture, cultures. There were so many different cultures involved. There were people from Australia, New Zealand, um, the Thai Cave Navy SEALs, global diving experts, the Thai government leaders, so the villagers. Clear communication was key. And failure was not considered an option, just like Apollo 13. I was really impressed by the way the Thai soccer team coach helped the boys focus on the tasks. He encouraged them to stretch the limited food they had and battery life left in their flashlight. He taught them how to drink water from the rocks. He also taught them to meditate. When you are task-focused, you are activating a different part of your brain, then the part where you experience fear and anger, and that helps you stay calm and focused on the future with hope. And I found that in the Thai cave rescue, there were so many different scenarios that were analyzed, and it was so complex. You know, and, and they had to really ask a lot of what-if questions. Should the rescue begin immediately, in a few days, in a, in a couple of months, at the end of the monsoon season? What's the best route and strategy for the support divers? Who should be rescued first? Wow, that is really hard. The strongest or the weakest? All of these questions, all of these challenging questions, 
And so the Thai cave rescue story is one of community, strength, resilience, and bravery. And in the face of challenge, resilience was cultivated through, a se through that sense of community. It created a safe place for people to problem solve. You know, and I talked about trust earlier, listening, learning together, sharing ideas, testing assumptions, just like you, you do with the first pr uh, principle thinking. And they received emotional support through that feeling of community. Community activates connection, builds courage to provide clarity and confi confidence. David Marquette is a strong advocate of community leadership. And so now, Jason, would you like to share tips for better critical thinking at work? I would love to, Vina. I, there's a couple of really good uh, questions from the audience um, that I would want to jump in. So um, a few people had actually jumped in and said, uh, my list of earlier uh, philosophers and critical thinkers was not as complete as it should be. Someone had mentioned uh, Mary Curie. Uh, is that how you pronounce the name, right? Marie? Yeah, Marie <laughs> Curie. Sorry. Um, that's a great one. And there's, there's others as well. Um, I clearly have some more research to do. Someone else um, had asked a question. Um, can you comment on how bias causes distortion in data gathering? I, lo my favorite question of the day. Um, there's, um, there's something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when you're looking for information, you wind up, your brain takes a shortcut, and you look for information to confirm what you want to believe. When you're gathering data, if you're only looking for information that you want to use to confirm your pre-existing thinking, you're only going to think through the things that you, your brain naturally wants to go to, and you're never going to expand your thinking. So I think confirmation bias is a great one to learn more about and understand to prevent yourself from getting in trouble during the data gathering um, process. Um, and Jason, sorry yeah, to ahead. interrupt. No, Neuro linguist Neurolinguistic programming, you know, when you think of something strongly enough, that becomes your established thought process, and that creates a neuro, uh, neuron in your brain. And so you believe that strongly, right? And that's what creates bias as well. Perfect, yeah. Um, when I asked, we asked for examples of um, great critical thinkers, and someone mentioned U.S. Airways Flight 1459 landing in the Hudson River in January of 2009. That was 2009? That long ago? Wow. Amazing. But um, yeah. that was, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of the pilot. Um, oh, shoot. But he was, uh, he basically had seconds to react while flying over New York City and landed that airplane into the, uh, into the Hudson River, saving hundreds of people's lives. Um, truly amazing critical thinking under what couldn't be any, there couldn't be any greater stress. I love that example. Um, another one is figuring out how to get through the BP oil spill. You remember Vina watching the, the videos of that oil gushing up from the broken well underneath? Um, yeah, that was exploded. scary. Yeah, un scary, but like the, the people that that were able to think through that problem, come up with an answer, were truly remarkable. Um, and the audience helps me remember that Sully was the, was the pilot. Thank you, guys. Very nice. Sully, most certainly. Yeah, uh, the pilot was Sully Sullenberger. Beautiful. That, by the way, great movie. Tom Hanks, we've now mentioned twice, Tom Hanks for Sully and Tom Hanks for Apollo 13. <laughs> oh, he's quite popular. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, so great examples. Um, so, Vina, let's talk about some tips for critical thinking. I wanted to make these as pragmatic as possible um, to make sure that there were actual things you could go use back on the job in a quick and easy way. If you're ever going to really establish a culture of critical thinking in your, at your work, you're going to have to do a heck of a lot of stuff that Vina was talking about around um, the, the temple that she had shown in that example. But here are just some, some, I hope, simple tips to keep in mind to help you more effectively think critically. The first, um, implement critical thinking at work as a writing organization or create a writing organization. 
there are few things that really train your mind as much as really good writing. You have to structure what you're thinking, think through it, put it in full, complete sentences, have it strung together, and have it make sense. And I'm not alone in that thinking. Um, very famously, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has banned PowerPoint from meetings. And what he does is he has people write up a summary of what they want to discuss in the meeting. People are quiet and sit there and read it in the beginning of the meeting, and then they discuss it. And that really makes you just find a deeper clarity in what you're looking to accomplish, and it trains you to think. That's got to be more powerful than a couple of bullets on a fancy PowerPoint slide or an emotional speech that gets people riled up. True thinking can start with writing. And if you want to get people to think um, and you have to persuade them, send them it in advance. Send them something they can read, give them time to do it, or even give them five minutes in the beginning of a meeting. It totally will change the dynamic of thinking in the room and really might um, get, be a good starting point for more effective critical thinking. Uh, here's another tip. So there's a lot of um, noise and buzz with the future of work and everything around algorithms. Algorithms are incredibly powerful. Um, algorithms, however, aren't completely unbiased. Um, however, there's some really good studies to show that they're incredibly effective to help humans perform typical tasks more effectively. There was one study um, by a team of uh, economists that studied automated underwriting algorithms in the mortgage lending industry. The, they were trying to understand um, or make the jobs of underwriters more uh, easier, but what it actually did was improve the accuracy of borrower, um, approving borrower rates, resulting in underserved applicants getting more mortgages. Um, instead of what you would think, which might marginalize underserved people, it actually more effectively helped those folks get mortgages. Another one was um, at the Columbia School of Business. Um, they studied the performance of algorithms in screening candidates for jobs, and that non-traditional candidates, when going through an algorithm at first, would be more served or have a better chance of getting um, a job than if just humans were looking at it. And these algorithms exhibited much less bias than humans did. And so there, you know, in our roles, this is supposed to be pragmatic tips. We don't all have algorithms running all the time to help us make decisions, but this is also about trusting data and looking at data to try and change your mind. Don't look at data to confirm what you're doing. Look at it a way to change your mind before you make a conclusion. Um, I think the evidence is pretty strong that algorithms and good data can reduce human and institutional biases, especially around decision making and problem solving. And so trust the data to try and change your mind, not confirm it. So that's tip number two. Um, tip number three is about uh, asking questions. For those of you that know Kepner Trigo, have been to a Kepner Trigo course, you won't be surprised that we love questions here. Um, there's this great article from Harvard Business Review from May well, with a quote from Dale Carnegie or Dale Carnegie, depending on where you are in the world. Um, he wrote a book in 1936 that said, quote, be a good listener. Ask questions the other person will enjoy answering. So 80 years later, that couldn't be more true. People do not ask enough questions. And in fact, the most common complaint that people make while having a conversation like an interview is that they weren't asked enough questions. So before you start talking, start asking. Um, why don't people ask questions? Well, that's, that's a good question. I think some of it's egotism, right? People like just talking about themselves. Sometimes it's apathy, they don't care. Sometimes it's overconfidence. Um, but this asking good questions can totally trump some of that. Um, I actually find asking questions, this is just a really practical tip, if you're in a cocktail hour or a networking event and you really don't like talking to new people, just go ask somebody a bunch of questions because you won't even believe how quickly people will be thrilled to talk about themselves to fill in the gaps. Um, and some powerful questioning tips. So first off, ask open questions. 
ask questions that allow people to give an answer that's free and open range to what they want to talk about. If you ask questions like a lawyer with yes or no answers, um, people are going to feel inter interrogated. Another thing to do is ask follow-up questions. So what asking follow-up questions makes you do is listen to the person you're talking to, hear what they're saying, think about what they're saying, and then respond in a way that allows you to either dig deeper into what the person said or find more breadth in a topic that you're talking about. Um, and asking those follow-up questions allows the person to know that you were listening and are interested in what they're saying. Um, another thing to do, this is an interesting tip from a study in that HBR article. Um, people are more willing to reveal sensitive information when you ask questions in decreasing order of intrusiveness. So if you know you need to ask someone some really sensitive information, start with something a little more vague and easy to answer and, and build towards that. Because if you start with the easy, sensitive stuff, people are going to get shut down immediately. So start with the, the general. Last one, the tone of your questions is critical. You have to use the right tone when asking questions so someone feels comfortable answering, and then don't be a judge of their answers. If you're a judge, people are going to be shut down and not feel like they want to answer any more of your questions. So um, I feel like that's um, about four, four tips or five tips that I threw out there, including my cocktail hour one, which is really good. You should use it. Um, to really get people talking more and getting more information um, through questioning. And that's really important in the gathering stage of critical thinking we talked about. Okay, tip number four. Um, Going back to the philosopher Tom Chatfield, he, I mentioned him before for the definition of critical thinking he gave. Uh, his big tip, which I want to share with you, is to invite refutation. It's a weird way of saying, look to, be, look to have your mind changed. Look to have someone convince you of something different. Train yourself to look for those things. In general, we need to share in our skepticism together. We should diminish our reliance on our personal views Acknowledge that our shared role in a culture of critical thinking, like Vina talked about, is to understand things more effectively. Um, there's a lot of frameworks and structures, and, and, structures of, and ways to do this, but if you just decide, I'm going to be reasonable, share in the project of encouraging collaboration with someone, and just don't get into the trap of defending your own opinions to the death because that's not conducive to any of this. Um, Tom Chatfield, this might be a little extreme, but he said we need an intolerance of intolerance. Um, and so I think this picture on the screen is perfect. You have two people who very easily could reason themselves into an answer, but all they want to do is stand on opposite sides of the same thing and argue about what it says. Um, and I just thought this was a great way of saying invite reputation. Okay, lastly, final tip. This is the one where um, our KT Kepner Trigo experience comes in. You, you can become trained to think more critically. Um, Thomas Euler, who is an analyst and writer, says that what we actually need most nowadays is both the capability and willingness to think critically. Hopefully, you're more willing to think critically because you're on this webinar. Capability is something that can be taught. Critical thinking needs to become a habit. Thomas Euler said, and that takes training. That's something that uh, us guys at KT know really well. Vina, who's been in the learning and development space for a long time, knows. You can be taught to slow down and think more critically. And um, you know, if you have questions about that, you can always uh, reach out to me afterwards because when you teach people to think more critically, you start building that culture of critical thinking, um, and then these things become more than the, just tips. They become a way that you act and behave. So, Vina, that was, um, that was my five tips. Did I forget anything uh, super important? And just to reinforce what you talked about, refutation, I think constructive conflict is, is also an effective um, tip. You know, in your organizations, if you encourage uh, meetings where you have constructive conflict, I think that helps you discuss diversities, diverse opinions, 
and it helps you look at different perspectives, explore different solutions. Um, and you know, some, sometimes you hold fast to something that you feel is definitely right. Um, but when you look at it from a different, when someone disagrees with you in a constructive way, it helps you reorient your thinking totally. And I think that's important. Right, Jason? Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Vina. Um, the audience has submitted some great questions, Vina. I'd like to run through a couple, and I'll, I'll kick one or two your ways, uh, too. So a couple of people asked if they can get the transcript for this program. So we're not going to transcribe it, but we will produce the video. So if you want to go in and uh, listen to us again, talk about critical thinking, that's great. If you want to have another conversation, reach out to Vina and I. We could talk about this all day. Um, another question, so how can you use um, critical thinking to help K through 12 students become critical thinkers? It's such a good question. So much of the research I did around critical thinking to just prep for today looked at education and the lack of critical thinking our students are doing. Um, I, that's probably a whole topic for a separate day. Kepner Trigo actually has a, a nonprofit called Trigo Ed, where we work with um, school districts um, uh, and helping students and administrations think more critically. Um, so if you're interested, you could look up Trigo Ed. But Vina, do you have any other thoughts on uh, how we can make students better critical thinkers? By ask, actually asking more questions and building verbal reasoning, I think um, people verbal clarity is very, very important. And when you focus on building your the power of your language and asking questions, that really, really helps from a, a student perspective. Great. Another question based on something you said, um, or I can, actually, let me. Uh, we can both answer this one, Vina. But it says, uh, any suggestions? for resources on constructive conflict and training on this. What do, you, what do you know about constructive conflict and how would you get trained on that, Vina? Constructive conflict is, is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, there are some books on it. I, I, I'd be happy to share that in, in your next email that we can share some resources on that, Jason. Okay, great. I mean, I would also answer, uh, let's remember that, Kristen. Uh, yep. Um, but to be trained on constructive conflict, it starts with that culture of critical thinking. People need to be comfortable to disagree. Um, they need to know that if they disagree, that it's okay to argue, to have an intense conversation, and that comes from leadership putting in place that, that structure. Um, so that's how I would handle it there. I've never seen a specific um, training on it. However, uh, we'll share some books that Vina has. Great, thanks, Vina. Um, so, there's another question here. Um, why, after so many years of critical thinking being around, you mean like 2,500 years of critical thinking, why are companies still using trial and error approaches for problem solving and to find root cause? Um, I think the easy answer to that is twofold. One. Everybody thinks they're a good problem solver, just like they think they're a good driver. If you ask people if they're a good driver, way more than 50% think they're better than average. Same with problem solving. People think they're a great problem solver. Um, the other thing that I think happens is that that type of problem solving is just easier. The default is to run around like a crazy person and just do stuff. People get rewarded for doing stuff, not thinking. And I think companies... I mean, Kepner Trigo has been preaching this for 60 years. Go back to Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, 2,500 years. It's easier. That's what your brain defaults to, and that's what people get uh, rewarded to do. Uh, someone asked for the, a link to the HBR article. We'll, um, we'll definitely try and provide that. Vina, here's one for you. Do you have any tips on how to handle people who defend their opinions to the death? Ask them questions. When you yeah, ask them questions, that's the perfect way. <laughs> it helps them. No, what does that do to them? It, it, when, you, when you ask questions, it helps you focus on the answer and, and focus on thinking from a different perspective. Um, and it helps you sort of analyze. I think questions help you analyze. That's why questions are the key. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't agree. I can't agree 
anymore. I mean, if you get someone who just will not get off where they are, providing your opinion is not going to help. But digging further into why they believe what they do is the best way to get someone to maybe think there is something else that uh, could be worth considering um, that you might have to offer. Um, so it seems like the group is uh, very interested in conflict, uh, constructive conflict, Vina. So someone mentioned uh, Ellie Goldratt's Evaporating Cloud as a good place to start for researching constructive conflict. Thank you so much for that tip. That's great. Um, and Vina, what do you think constructive conflict looks like in a team? What's a good team, a team who is able to constructively conflict with each other? What's that look like? Constructive conflict is, is when you focus on the facts, you gather data, and you don't let your emotions take over, and um, you know you don't be, become personal, but, but you focus on the actual data gathering. Um, and when you are objective, then that's, that's where con constructive conflict is most effective. Great. Uh, here's another good one for you, Vina, because it actually relates back to your disruptive thinking earlier in the year. We probably have time for two more questions, so let's do this one. How would you invite change if you have peers that have walled themselves off? How would you get that person to think about change in a different way? That's an interesting question. So the way to do that would be actually to, you know, create more exercises, brainstorming exercises, where you look at ways to come up with new ideas and create new ways of doing things. And I think that's, that's and implement change, a way to actually, um, you know, encourage people from different parts of your organization to come up with new ideas, implement them. And when you actually show them how change, how effective change is, that makes a difference. Great. Uh, someone asked here, do you think asking the why questions would create a sense of defensiveness? So the, the five whys is a great problem-solving technique. Um, however, if you were talking to someone and trying to dig deeper and they, they gave you an answer and you said, why? And then they gave you another answer and you said, why? And they gave you another answer and you said, why? Yes, I think people would feel very defensive. Asking questions is about relating to the person in their environment and knowing them and their personality and asking questions that they can relate to. So I would say that asking why questions is really important but you have to do it in, a, in an effective way to make sure that people are, um, are comfortable answering. All right, what do you think, Kristen? One more qu quick question. All right, so um, what graphical modeling technique, like mind mapping, entity relationship modeling, et cetera, do you recommend to enhance the critical thinking process? Well, to be honest with you, I, I, I think mind mapping is great. Um, I know our group here, we, uh, I work for the innovation practice at Kettner Trigo, and we've just recently used mind mapping. And what mind mapping allowed us to do was get a lot of information on the table, remember what we needed to, what gaps we needed to fill out, identify the questions we needed to answer, and then go do it. And mind mapping was really effective for that. All right, so let me just say thank you, Vina. We actually have to run. Kristen's going to close us out here, so thanks to the audience for joining. There's some other questions in there which we'll try and answer offline. Kristen, fire away. Thank you, Jason. To wrap this up and get you all to the next item on your to-do list for today, just a few parting items. We take these sessions seriously and are interested to know if you found this valuable please rate the session using the Rate This button on the console. We'll follow up with all of you through an email with a recorded copy of this presentation, as Jason said. Um, you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. And on behalf of Kepner Trigo and Western Digital, thank you again for your time. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.